Chapter 1. Understanding the concepts of economics is key to knowing how and why a country can develop. The study of economics makes us understand how economies work. The economies of various countries determine their developmental status. Without economics, we'll fail to understand the importance of trade and the value of selfishness. Humans are naturally selfish, and rightly so. Our selfishness doesn't necessarily come out of a dark place. It's an inherent nature that we have no choice but to exhibit. Our selfishness has led to many bad habits, but on the bright side, it has led us to civilization. The need to be better off is what triggers our creativity and productivity. Economics teaches us how selfishness, greed, and trade are essential to the growth of an economy. The most important part of an economy is trade. Trade is what gives us the chance to exchange what we have for what we want. It's one thing to recognize the importance of trade. It's another thing to know how to do it. Countries that are not developed are those that do not know how to trade. When a nation knows how to trade, such a nation knows its worth and brands itself well. Without economics, we wouldn't know how to trade or the importance of it. This is why Charles Whelan has taken his time to explain the basics of economics while using copious examples from around the world. If you want to learn more about the economics of economies, then you need to read on. Chapter 2 Greed and selfishness are an inherent part of us that can be used for good. In the U.S., there is no central authority that tells stores what items to stock, as there was in the earliest days of civilization. Stores sell the products that people want to buy, and in turn, companies produce items that stores want to stock. This is how the economy of any developing country should run. The economy is the art of making the most of life, while economics is the study of how we do that. There is a finite supply of everything worth having. Oil, coconut milk, perfect bodies, clean water, food, drinks, etc. The process of producing goods and services and trading them is what differentiates the gap between the rich and the poor individuals, organizations, or countries. You might wonder, why is it that Bill Gates owns a private jet and I don't? The answer is quite simple. He's rich and you're not. However, why is he rich and you're not? Economics begins with one very important assumption. People act to make themselves as rich as possible. We believe that individuals seek to maximize their utility because they derive profit from it. This assumption is correct, and it is the reason why there's a gap between you and Bill Gates. Economists don't particularly care what gives us utility. They simply accept that each of us has his or her own preferences and choices that determine how we live. Bill Gates is richer because people are more interested in his utility than they do to yours. If people's preferences change and they become interested in your own utility, there's a high chance that you'll also be able to afford a private jet. Our preferences majorly determine what we get utility and happiness from. Once we're happy doing something, we'll get more productive with it. Deforestation is frowned upon for people in developed countries, but for those in developing or underdeveloped countries, it is a means of survival. This shows that even though economics is universal, some factors divide it along different lines. Economists believe that working to better our lives is suitable for any economy because it leads to creativity. However, what betters our lives is relative to what we derive joy from. For Bill Gates, his love for tech has vastly improved the world. Osceola McCarthy had lived alone in a small, sparsely furnished house with a black and white television that received only one channel. What made Miss McCarthy exceptional wasn't the fact that she was poor, but because four years before her death, she gave away $150,000 to the University of Southern Mississippi, a school that she had never attended, to secure a scholarship for poor students. What gave her joy wasn't in spending money on herself, but in giving it to people. Economics is like gravity. Ignore it, and you will be in for some rude surprises. Charles Whelan Chapter 3 Good Policies Require Creating Incentives for the People in Order to Grow an Economy the black rhinoceros is one of the most endangered species on the planet. The unique animals have gone down in number from about 65,000 in 1970 to around 5,000 currently. The reason for this ecological disaster is not far-fetched. In the black market, the horns of these rhinos fetch up to $30,000, making them susceptible to hunters who want to make quick money. Economists believe that if the process of keeping the rhinos alive were a private business, then they would survive more. A private business owner would have made sure that the rhinos stayed alive because that's how he makes money. If he sells them to trophy hunters, he'll invest in breeding these animals to keep on meeting the demands. 
However, since the rhinos were not under anyone's care, people barely cared enough for them. First, the villagers who live near these majestic animals usually derive no benefit from having them around. Large animals like rhinos can cause substantial damage to their crops, and these animals are dangerous around kids. To make the community responsible, an effective conservation strategy must be created that properly aligns the incentives of the people who live in or near the black rhino's natural habitat. This means that we must give the local people some reason to want the animals alive rather than dead. Good policies involve using incentives to channel people's behavior toward the desired outcome. On the other hand, bad policy ignores incentives or fails to anticipate how rational individuals might change their behavior. A good economist must be totally focused on sound policies. The problem with a lot of governments is that they do not know what good policies are. As Gordon Gecko mentioned in the movie Wall Street, greed is good, so make sure that you have it working on your side. It should be noted that though greed is good, it can also be bad. Some of the most interesting problems in economics involve situations in which individuals acting in their own best interest do things that make themselves worse. We must realize that greed and selfishness are an inherent nature of humans that cannot be overlooked. People will definitely act in their selfish interests, even if it would affect them in the long run. Economics teaches us how to use good incentives and why we must understand that people will always act selfishly, but it is left to us to channel that selfishness for a greater good. Chapter 4. For an economy to improve, power must be shared between the government and the private sector. If governments were so good at determining the success of an economy, then government-intensive countries like North Korea, Oman, and Cuba would lead the world's economies. However, as it is, they do not, and this is because the government is good at doing some things and is tragically bad at doing others. The government can regulate an economy to the point of ruin. Sole reliance on the government to boost the economy has the tendency of leading to disaster. This is why it's essential to encourage private organizations. However, in the course of encouraging private organizations, we must pay close attention to the dangers of monopoly. Monopoly stifles any need to be innovative or responsive to customers. The risks of monopoly are the major reasons why both the government and private organizations should not be allowed to be in charge totally. The government should not be the sole provider of a good or service unless there is a compelling reason to believe that the private sector will fail in that role. Motor licensing organizations, for example, belong to the government in most countries. Having a license to drive is mandatory for anyone willing to drive a vehicle. Since people have no choice than to get a license from the licensing organization, the workers at these organizations can become rude or condescending to the people without fear. It doesn't matter how rude or mean a worker is to you, you will still have to go back if you need a license. While the workers might not be offensive if they worked for private organizations, to attract more customers and make more profit, the private organizations may issue licenses to undeserving people. The best solution would be a collaboration between the government and private organizations. In short, the government is like a physician's tool. It is an intrusive method that can be used for good or ill. When used carefully and judiciously, it will facilitate the body's remarkable ability to heal itself quickly. When misused or placed in the wrong hands, it can cause great harm. Government's view of the economy could be summed up in a few short phrases. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. And if it stops moving, subsidize it. Ronald Reagan Chapter 5. Information matters, particularly when we don't have all that we need. Markets tend to favor the party that knows more. The truth is that what we don't know can hurt us. An ignorant organization will not survive in a competitive market. Economics teaches us how we acquire information, why we acquire information, what we do with it, and how we make decisions with the information we get. In the United States, convicted felons are registered in a criminal record accessible to everyone in the country. With these records, workplaces can check an applicant's name against the criminal records to determine whether they are ex-felons. However, this system has worked against black men a lot. The general perception based on statistics is that black men constitute the majority of ex-felons in the country, and by default, black men are dangerous. One would have thought that with an accessible record to check, black men without criminal records would be hired, but that's not the case. When a black man applies for a job, all the employer cares about is whether or not the person standing in front of him has a criminal record. 
If he can acquire that information with certainty, then the broader social patterns don't matter. Social and racial stereotypes mean that most employers automatically assume that the black man has a record, so they don't bother to check. According to research carried out by a group of economists, it was discovered that employers who check criminal backgrounds are more likely to hire African-American workers, especially men. This effect is more substantial among those employers who report an aversion to hiring those with criminal records than those who do not. The lack of adequate information has continued to hinder black men and will continue to do so unless we protest against it. The need for information is why we have branding and why branding is an essential aspect of trade. Branding is what makes us shop for products and services whose quality we cannot quickly determine. Branding is what makes us buy a book without knowing its content. It solves a problem for consumers. How do you select products whose quality or safety you can determine only after using them? Consumers will trust your products based on the information available to them through your branding. Someone who decides to buy Nike sneakers knows that he'll be getting an excellent quality based on the company's brand. For an economy to function, it needs branding through information. Many countries survive on export, and that's because they have successfully created a good branding for whatever it is they sell. Did you know, more than 700 million people in the world live below $1.09 per day. Chapter 6. Human capital is what distinguishes a novice from a professional. Human capital is the total number of skills embodied within an individual. It ranges from education, intelligence, charisma, creativity, work experience, entrepreneurial vigor, to our ability to do what might look basic to others. It is the only thing we'll be left with if all the material things we've acquired are stripped of us. As with other aspects of the market economy, the price of a certain skill bears no direct relation to its social value, only its scarcity. People who have attained a professional level with their human capital would be appreciated more because they offer a scarce service. Athletes like Stephen Curry get paid more than their counterparts because they've mastered their game to a highly professional level. Getting athletes that can replicate their game style is difficult, and that makes their talent scarce. Human capital is about much more than earning more money. It makes us better parents and more productive individuals. It can make us healthier because we eat better and exercise more. Human capital creates opportunities. It makes us more prosperous and healthier. It makes us more complete human beings. It enables us to live better while working less. Through human capital, we can create jobs from jobs and give people more ways to get employed. Stephen Curry's brilliance needs sustenance, and this will lead him to hire a personal fitness coach. The personal fitness coach would also need to hire an assistant to fill in with his lesser clients. It would also mean that he might need a private space to practice, so he'll consult an architect who will consult the builders. Most importantly, human capital separates the rich from the poor. When we invest heavily in human capital, the dividends pay us well. One important thing about human capital is that everyone is useful to the growth of an environment. An architect won't lay a brick. However, the bricklayer's work cannot be overlooked. Even if the bricklayer is replaced by machinery, it still requires low-income workers to assemble, operate, and repair them. Without these low-income earners, the architect or engineer would find it impossible to execute any task. Chapter 7. Small-scale businesses contribute more to the economy than we might think. When it comes to interest group politics, economists believe that it pays to be small. This is because small, well-organized groups are most successful in the political process. After all, the costs of whatever help they get out of the system are spread over a large, unorganized segment of the population. Simply put, small-scale businesses in an enabling environment allow the sellers to make enough profit to return an excellent percentage to the government. In countries where farmers make up a small fraction of the population, such as the United States, the government provides large subsidies and grants for agriculture. But in countries like China and India, where the farming community is huge, the subsidies go the other way. Farmers are forced to sell their crops at below market prices so that the people living in urban areas can get basic food items cheaply. In America, the farmers get political favors. In China and India, they must pay for them. At the end of the day, the large group subsidizes the smaller group. Small-scale businesses control the level of inflation in a country. If a large percentage of these businesses cease to produce, massive inflation will occur. People don't really pay attention to an increase in the cost of living until it affects small businesses. Massive inflation distorts the economy massively. 
Workers rush to spend their cash before it becomes worthless. It breeds a culture where workers rush out to spend their paychecks at lunch because prices will have gone up by dinner. Fixed-rate loans become almost impossible because no financial institution will agree to be repaid a fixed quantity of money and interest when that money is at risk of becoming worthless. Inflation is bad for an economy. Even moderate inflation has the potential to eat away at our wealth if we fail to manage our assets properly. The truth is that any wealth held in cash will diminish in value over time. Monetary policy is a tricky business. Done right, it facilitates economic growth and cushions the economy from shocks that might otherwise wreak havoc. Done wrong, it can cause pain and misery. Chapter 8. International trade should be encouraged to boost the economy of developing countries. International economics shouldn't be any different than economics within countries, but this is not so. National borders are supposed to be a political boundary and not economic ones. International trade must still make all parties better off, else it would be a waste of time and resources. You buy a car because you think it is a good vehicle at a good price. The car manufacturers sell it to you because they can profit. At the end of the day, both the buyer and the seller have exchanged values that seem satisfactory to each party. As profiting as international trade is, the exchange rate massively disrupts it. The exchange rate is the rate at which one currency can be exchanged for another across nations. A Japanese yen has value because it can be used to purchase goods and services. A dollar has value for the same reason. So, in theory, it should be possible to exchange one dollar for whatever the value in yen would purchase roughly the same amount of stuff in Japan. If a good costs $30 in the United States and the same good costs 750 cedis in Ghana, one would expect that $30 would be worth 750 cedis based on the purchasing power. However, if a good costs less in dollars than it would cost in cedis, a clever entrepreneur can purchase the goods in dollars and sell it for a profit in cedis. But purchasing power only accounts for goods. It doesn't necessarily account for services. A hairstylist won't profit by styling hairs for the value of dollars in yen unless it is the other way around. A global economy makes it easier for nations to cooperate with one another. Our exchange rates do not necessarily have to be of the same value, but they must benefit both parties. Many countries with the exchange rate deficit do not necessarily bear the brunt because of the low cost of living. Meals in Mumbai, for example, cost far less than meals in Canada. While the Canadian dollar has more purchasing power, a Mumbai man would enjoy a better meal with 10 rupees than a Canadian with $10. While it might be impossible to stabilize the exchange rates, we must encourage international trades. Trading allows all parties involved to make satisfactory gains. Developed countries must be willing to purchase from developing countries. The goal of global economic policy should be to make it easier for nations to cooperate. The better we do it, the richer our economies will be. Chapter 9 Trade is the magical machine with which we can lift billions of people out of poverty. Imagine a machine that could turn cloth into a $10 bill or turn a basket of avocados into 200 yen. Such a machine would be a remarkable invention and would become essential to developing countries. With this machine, developing nations can put the things they manage to produce, commodities, cheap textiles, basic manufactured goods, into the machine and obtain goods that might otherwise be denied them, food, medicine, tech, etc. Developing countries that have access to this machine would grow faster than countries that do not. And this machine would be a perfect method for lifting billions of people out of poverty. We might think that such a machine can never exist, but amazingly, it does exist. This magical machine is called trade. Trade is the only way we can exchange cloth for money. It is the only way we can exchange food for tech and convert a basket of fruit to cash. There are many advantages of trade in an economy, some of which are Trade makes us more prosperous. Trade has the distinction of being one of the essential ideas in economics and the least mentally stressful. Trade gives us the room to be productive. Productivity is what makes us rich, and specialization is what makes us productive. Trade allows us to combine the two effectively. Trade lowers the cost of goods for consumers, which is the same as raising their incomes. It allows us to find a level playing field that makes the buyer and the seller feel satisfied. Trade is good for developing countries, too. Trade gives developing countries access to markets in the developed world. It allows developing countries to have access to what might otherwise be out of their reach. Trade paves the way for developing countries to get richer. Export industries often pay higher wages than jobs elsewhere in the economy. 
A huge percentage of people are poor because the rich countries have not tried very hard to change the status quo. The only way we can make the world a better place is if the developed countries are willing to support the developing countries. A good economy hurts no one. And when there are many good economies, things will work out better for all nations. Conclusion The difference between a developing nation, an underdeveloped nation, and a developed nation is the economy. The economy of a country determines its world status and bargaining power. Most of the developed nations across the world understand the intricacies of economics. They know how to trade, where to trade, and when to trade. While it's true that every nation in the world cannot attain the developed nation status, we can still bridge the gap between the rich and the poor by understanding the economics of trade. We must understand the government's importance and the contributions of the private sector to the sustenance of the economy. We must also pay attention to the dangers of monopoly and the disastrous effects of massive inflation. Allowing the government to control the economy totally can lead to ruin. The best way to ensure a good economy is brought to fruition is to encourage a partnership between the government and private organizations or individuals. If we unify as nations with the common goal of eradicating poverty, we can successfully bridge the gap between the rich and the poor through trading. Try this. If you have a business idea you would like to sell to people, create a brand by sticking with quality output. Do not let the prospect of huge profits cause you to produce a substandard product. Some of the world's greatest brands are known for their excellent qualities. When your quality is assured, consumers will purchase your products regardless of the price.